I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal lands this morning and pay my respects to Elders past and present. And in doing so, recommit myself to the scourge that is ending Aboriginal disadvantage. I'm talking to a room full of teachers. I don't need to hash over the problems that we have and the disadvantages and the gaps that we have in our um, Aboriginal communities. Um, and in acknowledging country, each and every time, I always make a commitment to ending the scourge rather than the rhetoric that we hear at the moment. Um, thank you to Greg Whitby um, for having me today and for asking me along and Mrs Walsh, who will always be Mrs Walsh to me from year two at St Joseph's at Kingswood. Um, she didn't have the misfortune of teaching me. Um, that was left to some of her colleagues, uh, but she was certainly a big part of our school back then in... Uh, Oh, look, you know, it was a couple of years ago, the 1980s sometime, um, but I remember her and remember her well. Um, you're all teachers, and to me, you have the most important job in anybody else in this country. Don't tell Malcolm Turnbull that, though. I'm sure he thinks he is the most important person and he has the most important job. But you are actually, you know, going on to educate uh, future leaders, people who will replace me, hopefully better, um, you know, the future technicians, the guy that was up there with his five investment properties, I'll check in for negative giving on the way out. Um, but you guys have the most important job and something that didn't come out in the bio, um, because we don't write it up because it's actually did not complete, was that I started my career wanting to be a teacher. Um, as all girls from Western Sydney do, we either become nurses or we become teachers. And if there's anyone from Western Sydney out there that went to Caroline Chisholm, I'm seeing heads nodding now. That is our, um, that's our pathway from Western Sydney. Because if you can't see it, you can't do it. And for most of the kids in Western Sydney, the opportunities to become engineers, the opportunities to become lawyers, barristers, they just can't see it. So one of my jobs that I really love to do is to have good relationships. And if I can spot Greg Elliott here, um, he will know when I'm speaking from the heart when I say I spend a lot of my days in schools. This week I lectured at the University of Western Sydney. I've been down to La Trobe because I am committed and passionate to education. I go into, um, anybody here from, um, um, Mary McKillop in South Penrith. I came there and spent a couple, hey, there, up the back there, the troublemakers at the back of the room, eh? Um, that was a great school to be in and I spent a lot of time with the six students there talking about Parliament and what it is that I do as a job. Um, and it was quite funny because the principal actually said afterwards to the kids, you know, Emma's not going to get any votes from you. She gets nothing out of this except that um, she gets to share her job and talk to the kids about the importance of being engaged. So today I have the job of um, talking about the challenges to transforming pathways. It's not going to be death by a thousand PowerPoints and I refuse to read anything that's written on the screen and if I do, happy to take attention for it after. And I think that I'm in the right kind of room to award that kind of punishment. So. Um, the most important job is the one that you're doing now, um, not only because I have a vested interest, because I have three school-aged children, but because without you guys, what would our society look like? What would it be without education? If we, if we didn't have education, if we didn't have, you know, an opportunity to send these kids to school, I mean, you know, there'd be a lot of parents pulling their hair out, which is about what's happening now in most times as we all count down to back to school day. But what would happen to our society without good education? So we know that um, education is in incredibly important to uh, our children's growth and their experiences and their journeys on the way forward. And you can all probably, you know, take a second now to think back to a time where you had a really good educator. Um, I don't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. Actually, in, in fact, I probably forgot to have breakfast. But I remember Mr Leahy from Kinder Blue at St Joseph's Primary School in 1985. <coughs> And I lost my, my canteen money one day. It was a big deal for me to have canteen money because there wasn't a lot of it in my house. And I was distraught. I still remember how I felt. I remember how awful that was. And he reached into his pocket and he replaced my canteen money. Now, for someone that doesn't remember anything and my nickname or common name is Dory, um, that's a pretty powerful memory. Um, Mrs Jennings, my year 10 religion teacher, who was in my life at a really critical point, I think that if any of us have got teenage daughters and I have a soon to be 16 year old next month, we'll all know the challenge around what happens in those years. And so she was my religion teacher 
and she made a massive difference in my life. I can't point to just one specific memory that I have of her, but just an overarching memory. She introduced me to the international, um, oh, I've gone blank now, um, the charity, the Amnesty International. And we used to do letter writing and we talked about the dancing bears and wrote letters to free people that were in detention. Um, she introduced me to um, environmental uh, action networks and climate change. I was a bit of a nerd at school, but I never got any nerd awards. Um, I did get suspended once. Um, I wasn't a leader. I didn't have any leadership positions, although, you know, I, I was quite... I think we'd call it bossy, but we don't say those words anymore. So assertive and, and fairly determined, but um, I didn't get awards at school. And I'll come to that a little bit later. Um, so those teachers, um, and then I had a great university lecturer who I will also mention later too. Um, but we can all remember a time where we've had a really great teacher who's transformed something about our life then, or that stayed with us now as educators. And I hope that some of you are teaching out the front of your classrooms, whether you've got kindies, or you six kids, or you're 11 kids, and you think back to that time where you had that teacher that changed your life and that you're doing something along the same lines. So we know that, um, that you guys, well, I know you work hard. Um, it's a shame that our communities don't see that um, and all of the work that goes in to what you're doing. And if I had, I guess, a dollar for every time I heard, especially in my job, oh, we just need to teach that in schools. Bike safety, road safety, drug education, respectful relationships, what else is there? Swim school, just needs to go into the curriculum. Or someone will come into my office and have a great idea and go, oh, we'll just get them to teach it at schools. And I'm like, eh, no, we won't. Um, no, we won't. So I'm, I'm your biggest advocates that we're not gonna keep stuffing out this curriculum to a point where it doesn't look like a curriculum anymore. Um, because I think that, that you guys are already overburdened and I'm not sure that we can keep up the hours of nine to three at school for much longer, given how intense that curriculum is. I'm sorry, I see you nodding in agreement, but I am really sorry to tell you that I think that nine to three is gonna be something that we did a long time ago when we talked to um, our kids or our grandkids. Um, and parents and communities play a critical role um, in, in, uh, in supporting our kids. And we do know that the most, uh, powerful determinants of a child's education and the most powerful indicators of if they're going to do well is how mum and dad or, or the carers at home actually feel about education. So if you've got somebody at home that's not supportive or not encouraging you, it's going to be pretty bloody hard to get ahead. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be something that's it's a slog every day. If mum and dad are too distracted, as were my parents, because there was a lot happening in my life, um, it's going to be pretty hard to make sure that you can meet the, the requirements for school. So our parents and communities do play a critical role and that's a challenge for us, which we'll, we'll get to later on. Um, we do need a strong school education system that is um, evolving. I'm in government and we are slow to change. We are incredibly uh, resistant to change and we do things at a very slower than snail pace. I don't even know what that pace is, but it is slow. Um, and so I think that the challenge in education and education settings, and you guys have got the added benefit that you are kind of a layer removed from the state system where you can do things that are more innovative and more agile and quite frankly, fit the day uh, rather than wait for governments to catch up. Don't tell anybody I said that. Um, no, I'm kidding. It's obviously being recorded. But I think it is... Um, <laughs> I think if we work together uh, more closely, we can actually... Um, we can actually make some of those changes more quickly um, and with a little bit more force and a little bit more impact. I think as governments, we tend to just tinker around at the edges. We've got this kind of boxy system that's nine to three and we're doing things the way we've always done them. We know that life isn't the way it was 20 years ago, even five years ago. Um, I, born, I was born in 1980, which was kind of that generation between Walkmans, Discmans and, and uh, social media and the advent of iTunes and all of those things. So I'm smack bang in that massive change and it's hard for me to keep up. So I know that our schools and our curriculums don't actually reflect what we're seeing in society now. Um, so we need to be far more agile than what we're being right now. Now we, uh, I guess, in this country have, um, you know, a few fundamental things that put us ahead of most other countries around the world. But it's not just, um, it's not just our country. These are the things that tie the Labor Party together. And I'm going to talk a little bit partisan now about the difference between um, 
you know, us and other parties and, and why politics as it is now is, is broken. Well, not broken, but people don't really kind of think we're getting much done. Can't take responsibility for the current mob running the joint. Um, but there is a couple of reasons why they're not getting things done. But the thing that, you know, everybody thinks is going to happen is that, you know, Pauline Hanson's going to rise up or you get Clive Palmer or you get all these other little micro parties that come into play. Labor was funded or founded on, you know, three pretty core issues. So it was um, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay, safe and clean working conditions, and unions. Uh, we were founded around the principles of universal healthcare. And if your Medicare card isn't front and centre at your, of your purse or your wallet, okay, if you're all clever and you've all got Apple Pay and you don't have to reach into your purse for your wallet, that's fine too. But if it's not the card that you see as soon as you open your purse, change that this afternoon. That is one of the absolute fundamental things that makes this country and our kids' lives be better. Uh, if you're like me, you've got a couple of kids. I took two of them to the paediatrician yesterday. I had some tests myself last week and all with the use of that little green piece of plastic. The other thing that um, binds the Labor Party together and Labor people together is education. So you can take a group of people like this, which is what the Labor Party looks like, and you know we've all got our different views and our different opinions and our different objectives and ways to want to get there. But unless you have something that actually binds you together, that you are fighting to change, not just fighting because you hate it, um, which is currently what we're saying, you have to be unified for something and you have to have purpose and you have to have passion and you can't just whinge about what's broken. Um, and those are the three really core ideas that keep us as a unit strong. Um, sure, we have fights about the way we get there. I mean, you know, Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, like, you know, I don't need to rehash that, but um, there are ways in which we navigate those challenges. Sometimes we do it well, sometimes we don't. But they are the three values that keep us together because we believe in absolutely every single person having a fair go and making sure that everyone gets through. We have nothing to gain from a system where those at the top end are getting everything that they need. And we just saw this week that the number of billionaires in this country has just grown again. I'm not one of them. Um, and I don't know any of them, in fact. Um, they don't live in my street. Um, I don't think they live in my electorate. Um, I'm not sure where I would even find one. But the fact is they're growing. But we also know at the other end, inequality is growing. And the reason I talk about that is because that education will transform lives and it is the absolute game changer for most kids. So our fundamental principle that every student, no matter where they were, got exactly what they needed. So that was under the Gonski version one model. I shall not speak of his name any further um, because of what happened obviously last year with $17 billion coming out of education. Now, most of you will know that I have Oh, you know, all know I've got three kids. So the middle one has autism spectrum disorder and a couple of other things. Look, he's just the quirky kid. He needs a couple of adjustments. They're not major. They're fairly minor. But with those adjustments and with the right support, he's able to make it through in a mainstream class. Now, under Gonski, he was able to get the extra teaching aid time, which didn't always go to him. The teacher worked with him teacher's aid was free to, to move around the class, as most of you would you know, have a similar model if you've got a teacher's aid in your room. But that enabled him to actually stay in a mainstream setting. And that's important for a number of reasons, but none more so than this. Our society is not broken up into the special kids go over there or the special grown-ups go over there and the other grown-ups go over there. We're all in together. We all have to work with one another. We all have to catch public transport with one another. Not today if you're on a train. Um, we all have to go into parliament with one another. We have to be in society with each other. And if you don't learn diversity, if you don't learn tolerance, if you don't learn empathy, if you don't learn those skills in primary school or secondary school from being with kids that are different to you, you won't get them anywhere else, which was why I was incredibly impassioned to reply to Pauline Hanson last year uh, when she told them all that they should go in their own classes. Of course, you know, there are kids that will always need uh, supported education, but for the main part, those kids that are a little bit quirky and a little bit different belong in our mainstream classes and in our mainstream schools, getting a mainstream education with their mainstream peers, because it will lead to mainstream employment and lifestyle outcomes, which actually, guess what, surprise, surprise, saves us a whole bucket of money. 
a stack of money when it comes to not having to house special people in special homes with special people to look after them with their special needs and when they can go out and have a job. So the next slide, um, and I hope that you've all seen this. Has anybody not seen this? Is anyone seeing this for the first time? Put your hand up. Okay, who's seen it? All right, excellent, good. So you all kind of get, you know, that equality and equity is two different things. Believe it or not, when I door knocked for my campaign to get into politics, I actually took this around with me. Maybe not this one, because there's a few different versions. I don't think mine had the, the little girl or little boy in the wheelchair on it. But this is what I used when I talked at doorsteps of people who said, oh, you know, everyone should just be able to get ahead because people actually think like that, you know, that everybody is somehow created equally and they've all come from an equal background and they've all had mum and dad at home working a job, earning over, you know, 60 grand, which is, I think, the magic number for whether you live in poverty or whether you don't. They've all owned a house and they've all had great role models. So... I would take this around and when I would be challenged by someone on their own doorstep, mind you, um, I would get this out and I'd say, well, this is, this is the difference between equality and equity. And this is what Gonski will do and this is what the current model is now. So the kid on the end needs nothing, needs for nothing. You know, he's probably someone that maybe, not to be stereotypical, but that we might find over on the eastern suburbs with a trust fund um, at, a, at an elite school, mum and dad are both working and food's on the table every day, no problems, no hassles. The little girl in the middle, she looks like she needs a little bit of extra help, um, standing on two boxes there. And of course, the little person on the end there that's in a wheelchair needs a whole bunch more to get up there. But with the right supports and the right foundations, we can get all of those kids to the same level, which was what Gonski was about and why we in the Labor Party were incredibly passionate about making sure that we funded all of those kids to get exactly what they needed. Um, Tanya Plibersek last year has committed to restoring every dollar um, cut by the Commonwealth Government, uh, $17 billion of funding cuts over the next 10 years. And that won't be important for when we do that, but it'll be important for the kids that have started at school under the Gonski model and had the resourcing, like my little boy, who will now this year miss out on his additional aid time, that he will now miss out on various things because that funding is absolutely not there. I'm also in the bind that he's in year six this year, and so next year is high school. So I now have the added challenge of having to move schools, which if you know ASD, that's gonna be an absolute pain in itself, uh, but also the challenge that there is not going to be the resources there to support him in a school in Western Sydney that has, you know, upwards of 800 kids in it. Um, he's not the worst, um, most needy kid, but he just needs some adjustments. Without those adjustments, he's the one that falls through the crack and he'll be in juvenile detention in a few years. You can all visit him. Um, so, I don't, I don't say that lightly. I mean that very, very respectfully to him, but he, he can be hard work, but with the right supports. And you would all be able to kind of think back to a child that you've taught um, or a child that's in your school now where you think, okay, this adjustment needs to happen because this kid is kind of there, but teetering around the edges, not the worst, not the best, but somewhere in the middle. Um, we talked about the social inequality and I'm just gonna get um, Paul to come up. Um, we're gonna play you a clip. Um, oh, he's... We don't have people in my office that can do this clever stuff, so I'm very grateful to Paul. So we're just going to watch the $100 race. Has anybody seen that before? Yep. It always makes my, uh, my skin stand on end and the hairs on the back of my neck come up because we all know that that's the reality. I mean, you could put an Australian voiceover on it and you could talk about some of the things that, you know, you change college for school and we know exactly that that is the same thing that most of our kids face. And... No more is the divide, I think. You know, we, we would probably say something like, if you're from Western Sydney, you know, take two steps back. Or if you're not from Western Sydney, you take two steps forward. Um, out where we are, we have some, some really critical challenges. I could stand up here and say that uh, my electorate uh, is the second fattest uh, local council area in New South Wales. I could tell you that we in Western Sydney have the largest uh, urban Aboriginal population than anywhere else in the country. Um, our multicultural challenge with LOAT um, and all of the multicultural challenges that come with it. And in 2050, there are gonna be more people living on the other side of Parramatta, we're just slightly on the wrong side, but on the other side of Parramatta, then we'll live on this side of Parramatta. So we have some incredible challenges. And when we look at that, um, that YouTube clip of the $100 race. We already know that we are so far behind in some of our eastern and northern suburbs cousins, um, and we live right next door to Sydney. 
Um, when I started teaching a couple of, well, I didn't actually get to teach, but we did some prac, um, and one of my uh, teacher colleagues was, she ended up being a golden key student, so I certainly picked the right person to study with. Um, she ended up being placed in a school in Mount Druitt, and, uh, you know, we'd, we'd often talk about, you know, who was doing what and, and whatever, and she recounted how the principal was just trying to keep ice dealers off the, you know, K-6 to playground. And when I went and did my prac over in Mount Druitt, uh, we taught the kids how to cook. And we were making hot dogs. And, you know, it's not a great meal, but for some of those kids, it might be the only thing they do ever learn to cook. Hopefully not, but we gave them a couple of options. And the little girl said, oh, I really like when we have hot dogs at home. And I'm like, oh, good, you know, this is, this is great. It's, it's lovely, you know, all warm and fluffy. She's had hot dogs before. You know, someone's looking after her. And she said, because the next day we get to have red soup. And I'm like, red soup? What do you mean red soup? You know, the water that the hot dogs come from. It's red soup the next day. At that point, you know, a little bit of vomit came up in my mouth and I thought that's quite disgusting. And then the next instinct was, I just want to take that child home with me. Um, and I'm sure that you can all think about students who would be having red soup. Hopefully not, but there would be a few of them. So when we think about that $100 challenge and we think about how we can um, challenge ourselves in our classrooms, um, I think it is imperative that we keep that in mind. But, you know, something that I get to do is um, the Lindsay Awards each year. Uh, you know, we get as MPs to go into schools at, uh, at the presentation end of the season or presentation season, as I like to call it. And I am a presentation junkie. I cannot get enough. Um, I love going in there and I sit there and I get tears in my eyes like I birthed these children that are up there getting awards. Um, I watch the, the performances and I watch them come up there with their shoulders back and their chests out and their chins high as they get awarded. Now we award the best math students, we award the best science students, we award the fastest runners. We award the kids who, you know, achieved the highest marks. We award the ones that showed greatest leadership qualities and led their peers. What we don't acknowledge or what we don't recognise is the other, uh, I guess, unwritten, unmeasurable and sometimes the things that we can't see. So the kids that have resilience, we don't measure that. We don't measure the kids who, um, you know, come to school sometimes from the back foot where uh, they, they might need extra courage just to walk into that classroom. We don't recognise the kids that have determination or a high EI. We don't recognise the kids that, through their resilience um, to overcome adversity, we never ever measure that. Now, if that was immeasurable, I reckon I would have gotten the award every year, but it wasn't. Um, so with what I'm doing with um, my Lindsay Awards and my opportunity is to actually ask all of our schools in our area to award one of those kids, to award the kid that's got caring responsibilities at home for a sibling or a parent, to award the kid at home who, you know what, just the fact that they've turned up every day for six weeks and haven't missed a day of school is an achievement for that child. We don't award the kid that, um, you know, was up until 11 o'clock last night because all they could hear in the kitchen was smashing plates and cups. We don't award those kids because we don't see it. And if you can't award those things, those kids don't know that actually what they're achieving and what they're doing is important and that they will get somewhere. Um, I'm in the Elle magazine this month. It's about this much written about me, so don't get that excited. Um, but it talks about me being a high school dropout. So I went, oh, I'm a high school dropout, awesome. Um, Greg probably sometimes wants to chastise me when I get up and, and talk in front of the girls at my old school when I say, guys, I didn't finish year 11 and 12. I did go to TAFE, but I didn't finish, and I didn't finish my university degree either. Sometimes in schools we get so caught up in measuring those things that are measurable that we forget to measure the things that aren't, the things that actually put us on a trajectory to change stuff and to be passionate about stuff. Now, I reckon I'm going all right. You know, I think I'm doing all right. Um, I didn't quite get to the end of year 12 and I didn't quite get to the end of my university degree, but I got schooled in life. And so I think that sometimes some of those other attributes should be awarded. And I challenge all of you this year to pick a couple of your kids out and really try and focus on what it is that makes them 
be able to achieve things. You know, we've all got kids in our classrooms that have got stuff going on outside of that nine to three. And if they've got stuff going on outside of that nine to three, I'm telling you now, those nine to three hours are going to be hell. I actually don't even remember being ever able to concentrate at school. Um, I always had my mind somewhere else. <laughs> Sue's looking at me, Mrs. Walsh is looking at me down here going, uh-huh, yeah, I remember. Um, and I'm sure if any of my other teachers are here, they'd probably all nod in agreement as well. I don't ever remember having my head in the game when I was at school. Um, I either had a hungry tummy or, you know, I was worried about what, what, what home was going to be like when I got there. So for all of you who have got diverse classrooms this year, and that should be every single one of you, um, think about those things. Now, the other thing that I get to do with my Lindsay Awards is to also pick one teacher for the end of presentation. Now, that's because I believe in you guys and I believe in the power of education. And whilst I've got a captive audience of mamas and puppers and grandparents and neighbours and cousins and aunties and uncles and relatives there, and I've got the entire school there, I make one teacher get an award. And so they get up and they get awarded for their commitment to lifelong learning or something that they've changed or done in the school. Uh, because I think that that is a real exemplar for not only their, their, peers, their peers and their teachers, but also the kids and the wider community that says, you know what, our teachers are important and it's okay to be awarded and to accept encouragement and praise when it is deserved. Um, some of the, the schools are a bit funny about it. They're like, oh, we couldn't possibly pick one teacher. And I'm like, yeah, you can. There's always got to be a winner. Like, this is school, guys. We've, we've based this whole competitive system on one person winning. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's taken a bit of a while. Last year, I had more teachers awarded than the year before. Um, look, it's a certificate, it's a book, you know, I write something nice. Um, it's not, you know, a couple of thousand bucks, I wish it was, um, but it is just something that says, you know what, you guys are doing all right. And it is to show and be an example to not only the kids, but also to the parents that are in the room um, to stop bitching and moaning about teachers and saying it's all your fault and that you didn't do enough. Um, because we all know that also happens too. Um, I think we're almost to the end, which is probably good because I reckon, is anyone keeping the time here? I forgot to look. Um, so we need to make sure, so my challenge is to make sure that we get the teacher training right and that there is enough training. When I was at university, I studied one unit, just one in special needs education and it was only uh, an elective that I chose to do over a summer school, um, which in our diverse classrooms is absolutely not enough. Um, We've got the diversity and growth in Western Sydney, which I managed, uh, I, I mentioned earlier about the challenges that we have and the challenges that we will face going forward in all of our schools. It doesn't matter whether you are in a, a public system, whether you are in an independent system or in your Catholic system, we're all going to have the same, the same challenges. Um, and how we become a more inclusive um, system so that all of those kids the ones at the back of that $100 challenge, the kids that never got off the starting blocks by, by having a two-pace advantage, that all of those kids can get ahead. Um, Pope Francis said, the mission of schools is to develop a sense of truth of what is good and what is beautiful. And our challenge is to how we deliver on, the, on, on that. And I know that um, Bishop was here this morning and is still here now. Um, I thought that you were going to be gone, so I'll just acknowledge that you are still here. Um, Bishop Vincent talked about the formation of the whole person and also that schools should be a refuge for the poor, an oasis for the weary and a hospital for the wounded. And I think there is no more exemplar of that than in Western Sydney, um, where our kids come with a whole bunch of diverse challenges that we need to meet as educators. And no pressure, guys. Um, we know that we are only human and that we can only do so much with what we have to work with, which is a bit of a rat and wheel because we go back to the, the need for resource and resource allocations. So we're going to um, do some questions now because unlike some of my colleagues who would have taken the full hour and a half allocation and just talked at you, um, I'm not an expert. None of my colleagues are in fact experts. Oh, maybe Dr Freelander, he was a paediatrician for 40 years. I'm happy to let him be the expert on paediatrics. You guys are the experts. 
You're the ones that are at the coalface every single day. You're the ones that do this day in, day out. I want you to commit to paper as a group and they've already been delivered to your table, thanks to Jane, my amazing staff member who's running around here somewhere, um, about how we address some of these challenges. Each table has um, a different but similar question. So we're gonna have a small group discussion. Um, you've got topics which I'll go through and then we're gonna report back. So the first one, if you've got question one, is how do we provide focused learning and teaching to meet the needs of all of our students. So they are every single student. So the Lope kids, the Aboriginal kids, they are um, all of the kids with, you know, every kind of challenge that we could possibly think of. The second question is, how do we provide for the diversity and growth in Western Sydney? This is my favourite. And the challenges and pressures this places on our schools and communities. Extra points if you talk about having local employment and more role models. <coughs> hint, hint. Um, question three is how do we create transformative pathways and an innovative learning environment for our students' learning, engagement and development? Now, if you're a tech head, you will probably be able to list all of those off and I will be most interested in your answers because that is my absolute weak point. Um, and question four is the best determinant for a child's educational success is the parental influence. How do we engage parents and communities to better understand their role and their power in that dynamic? That's probably my, uh, close to my first, maybe my second favourite question in all of this. So over to you guys. I'm going to um, turn on Pink Floyd's Brick in the Wall. Um, my university lecturer at Western Sydney, Alison, is our psych lecturer. She walked in one day, she's a bit quirky, and she came in with a lab coat and a stethoscope and some you know, she's very, very stereotyped as a scientist and played that to us and talked to us about not being another brick in the wall, another sausage factory mentality, about being uh, thinkers, about how all of our students are different and how each of them is an individual and how we get the best out of them. So um, I hope you all like Pink Floyd. Um, please talk loudly amongst yourselves, have a robust discussion and um, help me complete my homework to give back to um, our shadow ministry and create some change. <laughs> 